Good afternoon. Let me welcome you to the Woodrow Wilson Center. I think we're still expecting uh, quite a number of guests to come, but uh, because we do have limited time, we will go ahead and get started on time. Uh, and I'll point out in my introductory remarks here that we are being webcast live. So the webcast is on now, so don't do anything untoward. Uh, you're, you're being recorded. <laughs> uh, uh, welcome to the Woodrow Wilson Center. I'm Steve McDonald. I am the director of the Africa Program and the project on uh, leadership and building state capacity here. Um, appreciate you coming out on a nice uh, afternoon here in Washington, D.C. Uh, uh, the Wilson Center, as you know, is the official memorial to uh, former President Woodrow Wilson. Um, he, of course, was uh, uh, the only, doc uh, only president of the United States to ever hold a Ph.D., and was a true academic, he'd been the president of Princeton University. And he very strongly believed in uh, bringing together the world of policy making and the world of ideas, as he called it. That is the world of practitioners, of experts, of academics, of those who work in the field and who understand the issues around which policy makers have to make that policy. And uh, so that is the reason why the Wilson Center has been put together here, uh, created by an act of Congress in 1968. Uh, and we are happy to have four of this nature where we get to hear uh, some informed views on issues that are important to us. Uh, uh, let me begin, of course, this afternoon's uh, <coughs> deliberations by saying that we'll be talking about Nigeria, and Nigeria is important. It's important to Africa, to the United States, to the world. Nigeria holds nearly a fifth of the entire population of Sub-Saharan Africa. By 2050, it's expected to pass Indonesia, Brazil, and Bangladesh and take its place among the top five most populated countries in the world. Uh, this is according to uh, the United Nations estimate. Uh, Nigeria's middle income, mixed economy, and emerging market. Uh, with expanding financial services, uh, communications, and entertainment sectors, it's ranked 30th in the world in terms of GDP at $415 billion in 2011 and its emergent manufacturing sector is the third largest on the continent, producing a large portion of goods and services for West Africa. GDP per capita stands at $2,600 per person in 2011. It's the largest economy in West Africa. It is the third largest economy in Africa, after South Africa and Egypt, and on track to becoming one of the tw 20 largest economies in the world by 2025. For the United States, Nigeria is currently our 23rd largest good uh, trading partner, according to the Office of U.S. Rep Trade Representative, and it has 38.6 billion in total uh, trade during 2011. Uh, exports totaled 4.8 billion, and imports totaled 33.7 billion. As we all know, of course, those exports primarily exist uh, consist of oil. Uh, 33.6 uh, billion of the 33.7 billion being in oil. This amounts to eight, the being the 8% uh, of U.S. oil imports, nearly half of Nigeria's total oil production, and makes Nigeria the fifth largest exporter of oil to the United States. But a litany of outstanding uh, and new developments in security and environmental issues, both in the long troubled Niger Delta and in the newly uh, uh, inflamed North, present a real threat to this critical country. Uh, this includes development issues, inadequate and unreliable energy supplies, poor infrastructure development in much of the country, a growing th threat from Boko Haram, uh, uh, an Islamist extremist group born of local grievances but uh, in the North, but now fed by international terror networks, a lack of jobs, uh, serious public health issues, poor and sometimes corrupt governance at state and local levels, and north-south tensions uh, based on Muslim-Christian rivalries and unequal development between those two regions. Despite the relatively peaceful and successful presidential elections of 2011, there is a growing uh, rift between Nigerians and their government, which spilled into, an open, into the open in January when thousands protested the end of the government's longstanding uh, fuel subsidy, which caused food and fuel and transportation prices to skyrocket. While that issue is now behind us, for, uh, for the most part, uh, there is, as Professor uh, Peter Lewis uh, of Johns Hopkins uh, SICE uh, told a Wilson Center audience earlier this year, there is, quote, an unfortunate res resonance of division in Nigeria, of sense of marginality, and a deep-seated failure of government to provide some uh, sense of opportunity, hope, and basic accountability to the population. 
Today, we are privileged to hear an alternate view uh, from a op major opposition leader in the country about this situation and how it may unfold in the near term. Um, uh, in introducing uh, Governor Tenumu, I've asked my good friend and uh, uh, career foreign service officer, now retired, and former U.S. Ambassador to Nigeria, Howard Jeter, to say a few words and to give a full introduction for uh, uh, Governor Tenubu. Uh, the, uh, I won't say more about Howard's uh, background because you have that before you, except that he uh, currently serves as director of EHRC Energy and, and chairs the Charles Rangel Fellowship uh, Selection Panel at Howard University. So with no further ado, I will turn it over to Howard to introduce our guest speaker. After the, these uh, presentations, we will have a question and answer period. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for coming out today. I think that Steve has pretty much said um, all there is to say about Nigeria, with one or two exceptions. Uh, Nigeria is its people. And they are some of the most entrepreneurial, ingenious, hardworking people that I've ever met. Uh, I'm a big believer in Nigeria, even in the worst of times, but in good times and bad. And I will say what I said consistently during my tenure as ambassador there, that Nigeria is the essential country in Africa. And what happens in Nigeria will impact the entire continent. So if Nigeria is doing well, Africa will do well. And if Nigeria is not doing so well, and it happens, a it impacts Africa negatively. So with those few words, let me go about uh, the business of why I'm here today. And that is to introduce, and it is indeed my honor and my pleasure to introduce, Asawaju Bola Ahmed Tinubu, the national leader of the Action Congress of Nigeria, which is the preeminent opposition party in that country. Asawaju Bola Tinubu is best known for his tireless efforts, his commitment and sacrifices to establish and promote democracy and human rights in Nigeria. He's also known for his game-changing performance in public administration <laughs> and government, and for his acclaimed political skills and his leadership, his organizational acumen, and his extraordinary mobilization skills. A leading national political figure, Bola Tinubu was senator during the short-lived Third Republic in Nigeria, which, as you know, was aborted by a military coup. After four years in political exile, some of that time spent here some of that time spent in Europe, particularly in Britain. Um, Asawaju Tinubu became a two-term governor of Lagos State, which he transformed into one of the most important financial, commercial, and cultural centers on the African continent. His party, the ACN, scored stunning, stunning electoral victories in Nigeria's 2011 national elections. And although it failed to capture the presidency, the ACN has emerged as a major force in Nigerian politics as a loyal, responsible, and articulate opposition and a fearless voice of the people. 
Bola Tanubu is an accountant by training, and he's an honors graduate of Chicago State University. He's had a very successful career in the private sector, uh, working for Deloitte and Touche, working for ExxonMobil, and I believe working for Shell. Um, and at one time was the treasurer of the uh, country office uh, for Shell in Nigeria. He's the recipient of countless national and international awards and honors, and he holds a number of traditional titles, <coughs> including the influential, the highly respected, and the much coveted Asawaju of Lagos. In addition to his visit to Washington, Governor Tanubu is here with co-author Brian Brown, who's here somewhere in the audience, to launch a just published book called Financialism, Water from an Empty Well, How the Financial System Drains the Economy. And uh, I've read the book. I encourage you to do so once it's uh, in circulation. And it gives us some additional and very deep insights into the operation of the global international financial system and how it impacts uh, particularly African Americans in the United States, <coughs> but also Nigeria. The book launch will take place this Saturday at the Rainbow Push Coalition headquarters in Chicago, and it will be hosted by the Reverend Jesse Jackson. I know Asawaju Bola Tanubu is a man of integrity, commitment, <coughs> and exceptional dedication, and as a man who loves his country, Nigeria. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, Asawaju Bola Tanubu. <coughs> Thank you, Howard. I don't get to have such an introduction <laughs> very often. Thank you. The role of opposition in meeting Nigerians' challenges. Mr. McDonald, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I am honored to be here today at Woodrow Wilson Center, and thank you for inviting me. I commend the work that you do. This is an institution known for scholarship, lively discourse, and the search for policy that advance peace and development. By shining the light of knowledge, you help dis dispel ignorance and explore solutions to conflicts. Therefore, I will do my humble best to speak in the spirit that is the hallmark of this venerable institution. Nigeria is the focus of our discussion, conversation today, and I will attempt to briefly capture the challenges that confront us as a nation. I have devoted most of my adult life to promoting democracy in Nigeria. The battle has been neither short nor easy. I have lived in exile unsure if I will ever see my homeland again. My life has been under threat to the point where I did not know if I would see the next sunrise. I say these things not to boast. There are thousands who made, this, who made similar or greater sacrifice. I say these things so you may understand that my address to you is based upon the long-term perspective of a person who has occupied the trenches from the onset of the struggle for democracy versus dictatorship in Nigeria. I'm not of that class of politicians who have benefited from the struggle without participating in it. Because they never invested themselves in this <coughs> clash between liberty and blind might, these politicians do not fully appreciate 
nor do they seek to advance the cause of democracy around Africa. Because my life has been defined by the achievement and setbacks recorded in this struggle, I understand with every sinew and fiber of my being how far we have come and how far we are yet to go. <coughs> Nigeria, the house has not fallen, but its structure is weak. Nigeria currently is tossed by four distinct but related storms. First, we assist in a political limbo. Although uniform generals no longer formally control the levers of government, the ways and manner of military rule still dominate the political landscape. We hold elections in Nigeria, but that isolated fact does not a democracy make. Nigeria exists in that strange dimension where we have a civilian government equally possessed of the attributes of authoritarian rule, as if democratic governance. Every day Nigeria awakens. It awakens to this hybrid existence and a vexing question to which side shall the balance tip. Although most of us consider this an unfortunate predicament, numerous actors profit from the current state of affairs, leading figures <coughs> in the government party, the People Democratic Party, PDP, have repeatedly proclaimed proclaim objective of ruling Nigeria for an uninterrupted 60 years period. Such dynastic aspirations are affairs with true democracy. Then there are those of us who believe the veneer of democracy is insufficient in this day and age. We believe Nigeria cannot remain a confused, confused hybrid without succumbing to national regression. The nation must move either towards re-democracy or re-disaster. People are fond of saying that Nigeria is at crossroads. Our situation is more complex than what the phrase usually implies. We are like a person <coughs> with multiple personalities standing at crossroads. Consequently, we remain locked in a struggle simultaneously pull, pulling Nigeria in different directions. Democratic and authoritarian forces engage engage in a thug of war in which the soul of Nigerian governance is the price at stake. Due to the fact that competing elements of the political class have been locked for the last 13 years in this struggle to define the nature of government, there has been insufficient governance for the benefit of the people. We certainly have not seen much good governance. To be honest, we have not even had much in the way of purposeful democratic governance. Unfortunately, we have suffered more from inertia and confusion than from rule of intelligent but malevolent design. Second, most, mostly due to Boko Haram and criminal groups in northern Nigeria and in eastern part of Nigeria, internal security has ebbed to a low point. This has led to fear and uncertainty. Tension now dominates religious and political activities. It has been a profound, chi it has a, a profound chilling effect on economic activities in many areas. In many places, for example, children no longer go to school and farmers neglect their fields, fearing attack by Boko Haram. Third, ethnic and sectional Divisions are presently higher in Nigeria than at any time in recent memory. The ruling party reside in a state of chronic indigestion regarding the ethnic and regional allo allocation of top offices in the party and government, especially that of president. Although members of the same ruling party, political figures from the north and the south hall often reckless accusation at each other not because of differences over substantive issues, but because of regional loyalties. They don't differ over substantive issues because they really think about such matters. No, they bicker across the widening geographic and ethnic divide that they have helped to create. They benefited from it. Those who should aspire 
to the status of statesmen, launch at one another like street broilers. Talk of disintegration is now fashionable in some quarters. Two weeks ago, a faction of the movement for the survival of Ogoni people, Mosop, issued a declaration of independence in Nigeria and designed a flag representing the sovereignty of the Ogoni people. Call for self-determination by the Southeast based movement for the actualization of sovereignty of Biafra, Masop, have intensified. Last week, Masop threatened and reported to have applied for United <coughs> Nation observer status. After these developments, the new sense of a jaw, ethnic consciousness, similar to ethnic agitations and Boko Haram's anomie, and you will realize that all is not well with Nigeria. It is clear that Central Africa forces have gained strength, and this noxious gain is substantially due to the intramural machinations that define the ruling party. Fourth, for the majority of Nigerians, the economic function as an obstacle, not an ally. Government claims that Nigeria enjoys the world's third fast, fastest growing economy with annual GDP growth of roughly 7%. This handsome figure contrasts with the unattractive lives most people endure. Income equal inequality is among the worst in the world. A higher percentage of Nigerians now wallow in abject poverty since the ruling party came to power, with insecurity escalating across the large swath of the land, electricity generation at the miserable 4,000 megawatt for an entire nation of over 150 million people, the collapse of the manufacturing industry and the spiraling unemployment figures of the youth and the college graduates. It is difficult to take the GDP figure at the base value. Nigerian government find it convenient to lie. If by happenstance, the GDP approximates the truth, it means super elite within the elite benefit enormously while the rest of the nation suffers. True national prosperity cannot be funded on such a top heavy architecture. Most Nigerians believe their lives are much harder now, now more, than the thir more than 13 years ago and getting worse. The hope that people still have about the future has nothing to do with the quality of government economic policy. It is mostly due to an innate sense of optimism that is uniquely Nigerian trait, which divides the normal standard of logic. It is one thing, it's one of the things that keeps Nigeria afloat, though many things, many th things issue have gone under. The picture I've painted is stark but accurate, ash but hopeless, but not hopeless. If I thought things were beyond hope, I would pursue another vocation. I'm glued to this path because I believe a democratic, responsive government can improve Nigeria and that government will still come. However, if it persists along current policy lines, the federal government will resolve nothing and we preside over a worsening state. I do not claim the opposition to be a choir of angels. We are not. Not all who call themselves to be opposition, opposition politicians are bona fide Democrats. There, are, <clears throat> there is a principled opp opposition and opportunistic one. Some are the, str the strong good element, the strong to the element of the current regime who have slipped into the opposition for a chance to set your personal score or to advance personal ambitions through a different route. These people are opposition in name only. In reality, they are but the, the photographic negative of the status quo they purported to oppose. Nor do I believe those in power are evil incarnate. However, the overriding concern of the PDP political community is to retain power, not to advance the public welfare. 
we fall our gaps and the imperfections. The opposition is possessed of greater civic purpose and has in mind substantive policies qualitatively better than the toxin the current government is brewing. In the rest of this address, I will contrast the policies of my party, the Action Congress of Nigeria, with those of government. You will see that we have significantly different visions. The problem with our current ruler is it's not that they don't love Nigeria. They love the concept of Nigerian well enough. The real problem is that they care little for the average Nigerian. Insecurity, a growing nemesis. Nigeria is fast becoming one of the most dangerous, described as one of the most dangerous in Africa. The story of militia killings, brutal attacks, and bombing we thought was restricted to Afghanistan, Iraq, or Somalia, are now daily fear in some part of Nigeria. In Boko Haram, Nigeria confronts a creeping, low-grade, brutal insurgency. These ex extremists oppose more than the government. They threaten Nigeria democracy. Large part of the country now lie outside the effective control of federal government. People in these areas are more cognizant of the extremist senseless violence than they are assured of the government's ability to stop it. There has been an energetic debate whether poverty or distorted Islamic radicalism fits Boko Haram's emergence. The debate is unnecessary. Both are factors. Poverty is a terrible witch that most of its sovereign bear silently. What Rankus is not simply poverty, but poverty occasioned by injustice. When young people concluded that their lives are finished before they start, and that the reason for this is the corruption of government and established leaders, enters radical violent ideas about Islam and the wrecking ball to tear down the corrupt edifice. Without this, combustive mixture of poverty and injustice, Boko Haram will be a fringe movement with a few members engaged in petty crime. Because of this combination, Boko Haram is a socio-political reality which many members, with many members and even more sympathizers. Boko Haram is succeeding in its agenda to upend Nigeria, not only as it challenged government authority across the North, it has revived ethno-religious antagonism that were better left to bury. In the face of this threat, government has been ambivalent. One day, government states it will forcibly deal with the group. Next day, government leans towards negotiation. Although this problem has been with us for some time, policy, policy coordination remain remains ineffective. Because government fears decisive action will produce political fallout, they have resolved to be irresolute. Thus, government has done little except leave an overstretched and under-equipped police force by by French army units, the most heavily scared location. To respond to Boko Haram, Boko Haram and dispel their cells, the, the most one can say is that government policy is one of soft containment. This has proven to be ineffective and perhaps counterproductive. Government must realize Boko Haram is more than a law enforcement problem. It is a socio-political threat of such magnitude that, conf that confronting it can no longer be subservient to crass political calculations. Government must operate on gender on a grander scale. Why I do not fully agree with the Assistant Secretary Carlson's proposal to create Ministry of Northern Nigeria, I endorse the implication central to its recommendation. Bold, strategic innovation is what is required. Corrective policy must be twofold. First, it must protect the people from repeated attacks. Second, it must weaken the extremist organization. Clandestine groups of this nature 
are comprised of actions of hardliners, pragmatists, and casual followers. The task at hand is to drive a wedge between the other subgroups and the hardliners. The pragmatists will be amenable to negotiation and reintroduction into society as a social political solution is being fashioned in a way that reduces the number. Operational breadth and political strength of Boko Haram will be dealt with decisively. What follows are important suggestions that we made to the government and we continue to emphasize that government should employ to achieve these uh, objectives. A, improve local community based information gathering and sharing. B, enhance local conflict resolution measures. C, deploy adequate and trained security personnel and establish community policing. D, compel better coordination of intelligence among security agencies. E, set up local human rights monitoring groups. F, create employment and economic opportunities. Open G, open dialogue with the pragmatists and local opinion makers. H, provide feeding lunch in primary school and high schools to take the children off the street. I, direct support to the farmers combined with skill development program for the unemployed, particularly in those affected areas. Economic policy, the richer the nation, the poorer the people. That is what is operating right now in this government. The first differences between the government's economic outlook and that of my party was manifest in the government's mishandling of this fuel subsidy remover. Government revealed a preference for physical austerity that will increase cost paid by the private sector, thus deflating aggregate demand at a time when the private sector was stagnant and more deserving of physical stimulus than in need of restraint. The, pro the public eruption that followed the government decision transcended the fuel subsidy. This decision and the public reaction were about the relationship between government and the people and about the primary objective of government role in the economy. The protests were because people felt betrayed. Government decision to remove the subsidy was made uh, simply because this government saw more value in making money than in saving the hard-pressed masses. In other words, the people were not worth the expenditure or in the investment. By seeking to end the subsidy, government breached the social contract for no compelling reason. Month before the fateful decision, the opposition, including myself, met with the government and warned it about the dangers of its approach. Instead of attacking the subsidy because it affronted economic orthodoxy, government should have weighed the actual political and economic benefits of the expenditure. The opposition insisted that there must be conditions precedent. My party was not wedded to the subsidy, but was wedded to the maintenance of a comparable level of investment in public on social program. We suggested a plan whereby the subsidy would be met methodically phased out and the people compensated with investment in public transportation, primary health care, and infrastructure development. Complementing this will have been the public affairs strategy, fully explaining to the people that the change was not to breach the social contract, but to improve it. The government, however, chose to ignore our counsel. It went ahead to leave the subsidy in a deceitful manner. Government also deployed armed soldiers in a democratic environment to deter further protests. This episode revealed the vast difference between opposition and government economic policy. The priority of physical policy should be the maximum improvement of the overall economy. Physical surpluses or deficits are but tactics to achieve this objective. Sadly, government has elevated a mere tactics to the status 
of the primary objective. The Nigerian economy is characterized by idle human capacity and thus suppressed aggregate demand. Governments, governments uh, physical policy has a significant role to play in putting the idle to work. The current administration seek the path of austerity. This will push Nigeria into, this, into the same predicament of the United Kingdom and the Eurozone, now the problem they now face. Government expenditure is needed to stimulate the economy up to the point where the growth of inflation does not cause such damage that it erases the benefit derived from additional expenditure on its people. Last, we need to reform the Nigerian Petroleum Corporation, NNPC, and the libraries of agencies that nurse it under. The current petroleum bill, PIB, is not right effective, it's not the right effective prescription. For instance, the bill yields too much power to the Ministry Minister of Petroleum. Furthermore, some part of the bill makes the oil sector even more fertile ground for corruption and patronage. The bill should be amended so that the NMPC functions like a duly regulated public owned and publicly traded company. This will minimize the opaqueness that now follow that now characterizes company operations. And revenue will be will then be used for their stated purpose and not some wants the pri uh, private political goals. Also, the PIB needs to be recalibrated in order to strike a fairer balance between the needs and objective of international companies and the needs of Nigerians. The Brazilian experience with Petrobras and the sources made of the, of the program is instructive. Norway is also doing better because transparency because of transparency in its oil industry. We have a lot, a lot to copy from. If we can take these uh, aforementioned uh, steps, government will promote growth that benefits ordinary Nigerians. If we continue as we are, the Nigerian economy will cement into a highly bifurcated on just one that a small elite enjoys the fruit of life while the majority of Nigerians participate in the losing side of a lifelong contest against poverty. Electoral reform. This is less than me the high. As a result of agitation for the op by the opposition after the year 2007 elections, the late President Yadra inaugurated, inaugurated the Electoral Reform Committee, chaired by former Chief Justice Mohamed Uwais. The committee produced comprehensive report enumerating its three substantive recommendations. With this document, Nigeria has the blueprint needed for electoral reform. If implemented in, the, in full, the report will have radically transformed the political landscape of the country, placing Nigeria on the path to fair elections and legitimate, legitimate democracy. Save for the predicament of the INEC chairman, replacement of the INEC chairman, only few of the recommendations were enacted. The 2011 elections were better than the 2007 edition. However, they were not of the outstanding quality government and many international observers claim. Observers claim. In a way, International observers did Nigeria a disservice. Expecting the worst, they unduly applauded the modest improvement that took place in year 2011. Observers should not have take, been taken in by the orderliness of the ballot casting at the long uh, local polling booths. Your observers did see what happened before the election day or after the polls closed. Observers judged a complicated electoral play solely by film one of its acts. If they had observed more carefully, they would have seen 
that hundreds of members of the opposition were beaten, threatened, several others came, and scores detained simply for carrying the membership card of wrong party. In part of the country, it effectively became a crime to be a member of the opposition. In Nigeria, the ordinary people have always done their part. The people are ready for democracy. It is the most powerful faction of the political elite that is not. This is a true picture of the year 2011 election than the tidy, tidy uh, Vibu widely, widely disseminated. The negative consequence of the overinflated measure is that the bar has now been set too low for subsequent elections. <clears throat> Those in power believe they do not need to improve the process. There will be a gross miscalculation should subsequent election be of the same decimal quality. This could be an eruption, there could be an eruption that will bypass the court system as the best means of, for resolving the egregious malpractices. Although facing, facing with this stark deck, the ACN registered electoral gains. Made anxious by, fit, by our fitness, the PDP determined that we shall not win another contest when they fill the incumbent. In this vein, the loan reform they promoted since year 2011 was a measure terminating electoral complaints 180 days after their filing. Rare, rarely do cases get heard within time allotted by the new provision. This means most cases will ultimately be dismissed on a feeble technicality. All the guilty party need to do is to stall the court proceeding, which is an easy feat in Nigeria. If this law had previously existed, the, sus the successful complaint lodged by the opposition to retrieve the stolen mandate in Ekiti, Oshun, Edo, and Ondo State after year 2011 election will have been rejected on technical grounds. The criminality of those who who actually lost the contest and rigged the vote tally will have been reward they will have been rewarded by granting them the highest office in their states. Let me state unequivocally that the 180 day law is an imposition against just disposition of electrical electoral disputes. It is a cynical use of the law to protect the corrupt hijacking of electoral process and electorate will. The ruling party, PDP, has used the tyranny of its majority in the parliament to abrogate the electoral rights of Nigeria to fair hearing. The opposition will be relentless in the fight to obtain this unjust law. What the new 180 days law does is, is forced to strike fears in the mind of citizens that legitimate petition will fail and then promote doubts about the electoral system and the dispensation of justice. Ultimately, this could lead to people pouring out on the street to resolve electoral disputes or simply resort to other means of self-help. Ladies and gentlemen, I restate that what this law has done is to circumscribe one of the fundamental human rights of the Nigerian people. That takes us to rule of law in Nigeria. Where is it? Demonstrating its preoccupation <coughs> with remaining in power, the PDP government has engaged in a sustained attack against the rule of law, starting with the Obasanjo's administration to the present. Its regard for the judiciary and the rule of law has become the stuff of a political legend in Nigeria. When confronted with an adverse judicial system, the PDP government does what authoritarians do. They act as if court does not exist. 
And if the decision was never made, this makes ruling much easier for them, but makes democracy less real for the rest of us. If a judge has the temerity to deliver a few decisions in harmony with the rule of law, but against them, our rulers do not accept it in good faith. They, pr they are prone to discipline the honest jurist. Thus, one year ago, the government suspended the Court of Appeals President, Salami, because he has the courage to follow the law. Salami's wrong was that he did right. Despite several panels of eminent jurists exonerating him of any wrongdoing, any impropriety, the government of Jonathan Goodluck has refused to respect the verdict of the law by restating Salami, Justice Salami. An innocent and upright judge has been made to suffer. This shoddy treatment of a senior judge, particularly the president of the Court of Appeal, had a chilling effect on the rest of the judiciary. By effectively dismissing him, the government intend a strong caution to other judges. Apply the law to us and you are in trouble. Do as we wish, your position on the bench shall be assured. This government cannot prosecute a war on corruption. To do so, we require, <laughs> we require the government to mainly fight itself. That is why the EFCC, though being aided by a core of professional and a team of well-experienced hands, operates with little independence. No, uh, little independence. There is undue interference in the, by the Ministry of Justice and the Presidency. Those cases are initiated but never finished. People are arrested but never effectively tried. Sometimes they are let go with only a slap on the wrist. It is mostly theater and little fact. Someone recently quipped that the current administration has a unique way of minimizing corruption. It allows a choice few to make away with such a king's ransom that everyone else who will consume at the government's straw is forced to, hon <coughs> to honesty because there's nothing left to take. <laughs> Additionally, the PDP government efforts at constitutional reform are confined to the aim of securing political power. They seek to abuse their majorities in the national and state assemblies to ramp through amendments, solidify their grip in power grip on power, we need to discuss our future. If necessary, conduct a referendum on a number of issues that are germane to our future development. <laughs> the idea that a ruling party can use its bogus majority in National Assembly to tamper with the Constitution and abrogate the right of Nigeria to vote and be voted for, to fear hearing, alter the independence of the judiciary, and promote division among the citizenry cannot chart a path to progress and development for the country. Governance at national level has veered too far, of course. Tinkering around the constitution, to consider edges, cannot provide the needed corrective measure. To most of us, the Jonathan administration appear like the dazed captain using a teaspoon to build water from a sinking vessel. <laughs> we require a national conference for two important reasons. First, the present constitution was never established by we the people. It is the handwork of the military. A constitution that was forced on us does not have the requ requisite legitimacy needed for such a complex, diverse nation. The past 30 years have revealed imp important flaws in the constitutional structure namely the capacity of federal government executive to arrogate the powers of other governmental institutions. The exclusive legislative list for federal government is too large, cumbersome, it's anti-progress. We need to drastically overhaul the constitution to provide for a more perfect federal system 
that restrain the ability of federal executive to encroach on the prerogative of other institutions are on individual liberty. My conclusion, Nigeria has entered a troubling period. Government which is supposed to resolve the nation's challenges now does the reverse. President Jonathan may have won the 2011 election. However, since then, his errant policies have awakened the people to the great mistake they made when they handed him the staff of office. If an election is, if, an, if elections were held today, Jonathan would not win. To all Nigerians, his administration has been a disappointment. If it continues as, as is, they will come to see it as a manifold disaster. By these policies, political and economic, the people believe he has turned his back on them and that he has broken the contrast between the government and the governed. If given a viable alternative, they are more than ready to turn their back on him and his party. The opposition is now ready to provide that alternative. Political competition in Nigeria is no longer primarily driven by personal rivalry or ethnic consideration. No. Democratic policy and principle drive the politics of our party. On one side, the stand of PDP and its governing aristocracy, the vision for the nation is neither caring nor democratic. Their vision is to impress the vast majority of the service and give small elite the crumbs. They seek a Nigerian that is modern in appearance, yet quietly medieval, medieval in the relationship between governing elites and governed masses. The, on the other side, stand the pr progressive opposition that seek a more democratic, decentralized political structure, as well an open economy that creates more opportunities for those Nigerians who live below the crushing poverty line. Yet, Nigerians are not a sadistic lot. They know what they want, and the kind of, they want good governance, such as we have in six states controlled by the Action Congress of Nigeria. They can deliver good governance. Nigeria will vote wisely, but fear that an independent electoral commission, where card carry members of the ruling party are appointed as resident electoral officers, will manipulate their votes, which is not acceptable. I have no delusions that development, the, the tax of developing Nigeria <coughs> will be hard. <coughs> the task of, of unseating the current party in power may even be harder. Yet, for the good of Nigeria, the opposition will persevere. The international community must support Nigeria in the renewed struggle to ensure the sanctity of the ballot box foster respect for the rule of law, and to build democratic and economic institution that will endure. Nigeria, as you said, is very, very important to Africa. The stability therein is the stability of the entire continent. And thank you for listening to me. Thank you, Governor Tinubu. Um, we'll now open it up for, we've got uh, about a half an hour or so that we can have questions and answers. Uh, let me remind you, first of all, that we are being webcast live. Uh, so the procedure will be, we'll take two or three questions at a time, if that's okay, Governor. Oh, I sure. think it's probably easier. We'll group them together. I'll help remind you what's been asked so you can get the answers out. Uh, but uh, wait for, a, when you raise your hand and I recognize you, I'll do the first person right here, wait for a microphone and introduce yourself and your association. Right there on the corner, yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, so my name is Sali Hugarba. I'm from VOA House of Service. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a 
good you organize this uh, lecture, but my question is directly to you, the organizers. Oh, okay. Um, why is it that uh, there is no, you didn't invite uh, government representation from the other party? They were invited, uh, not on the podium to speak. We were having an alternate view here, uh, but they were certainly invited, uh, the ambassador and all of his staff. I'm surprised not to see them here. Okay, all right. Are they around? From the, the government Buster? side? Because we would like to hear their reaction. Okay, is thank it, you, thank is you the, very is much. The, I don't see the ambassador. I'm sorry, did I miss? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, the ambassador? Oh. Oh, well, okay. Well, will this man from the VOA, do you want to interview him afterwards? Do you I want will. him to make I, a public I will. statement? I will. I will. I want, okay. to, I want to hear his reaction. I mean, I mean, he's perfectly welcome to ask yeah, a question okay. or pose an alternate view. That's all quite right. all right. Thank you very much. Sir, would you like to do so now? Or? Well, my name is uh, Ambassador Obasi Achibong, the Deputy Chief of Mission, Nigerian Embassy. Yes, um, I have to thank the organizers of this uh, forum and also the speaker, my senior brother, Senator Dr. Asweju Tedebu. He has spoke so well. But I cannot stand here and accept all what he has said, hope and seek. He has fought so much for democracy right from the time of Nadeko till now. We know that uh, the present government is not a demon. The government is not a demon. There are certain good things that the government has done. We have a problem in my place that you cannot, as a good son, go out and say, oh, my mother's soup, or my mother is not a good cook. <coughs> Whatever is the case, I know that President Jonathan has been trying his best even to contain the menace of uh, Boko Haram, which he did not create, which, which his government did not create, which the opposition party created. Mm -hmm. Yes. The opposition party created, that, uh, the opposition created the menace of Boko Haram. Boko Haram, we all know, that started from Bono State. And Bono State is not controlled by PDP or the government. It's controlled by the opposition. It started like what he said yesterday. Derek. Most of the thing I have those who were around at CCA yesterday had my own views about some of these things. So uh, you see, it's a music that has been overplayed by our learned senator, governor, Tinubu. This, what we have said today has been said all over, all over, every day. So the music is now overplayed. It has now faded. We should look for some other things to say. We should look for other issues. Like the electoral reforms, the government set up the OS report. And government accepted. And look for an umpire which has nothing to do with any political party. That's the present INEC chairman, a lecturer, a citizen who was also one time a super president. So I would think that uh, <coughs> coming to the economy. We all know that the present <laughs> economic model all over the world now is privatization. No more with okay. The government has been trying to privatize 
the energy sector, the oil sector, the government is working so hard on that. The government is working on the, on the issue of transportation. The rail, there is a rail now, now about to. The government has just approved money for Abuja, Abuja, Kaduna, Rail Link, and others. So I believe that this government deserves to be given time. I know you said you'll be talking to the government. I will employ you to talk more. Okay, thank you, Ambassador. Appreciate your views. So continue to talk more. This is a house you don't have in other country. This is not the time to play politics. I know that most of these things we are saying now is geared towards 2015. Is that so? So let's see, as at then, the electoral will decide who they want to lead them. So thank you very much. Okay, and that's the way democracy works, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you're not required to respond to that if you don't. I, I don't need to respond to that uh, remark. And, uh, I think we should face a very constructive and more important uh, and, uh, question so for the country. Okay. Thank you very much. All right, we'll go on. I want a person in the middle there I saw early on. Okay, right there. This, yes, mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. Here comes the microphone. Please wait for it. Thank you very much, Mr. Moderator. My name is Bimbo Daramola. I am a congressman, a member of House of Representatives of uh, um, Nigeria, mm -hmm. a parliamentarian, National Assembly. Um, I ordinarily would like to thank you for the opportunity to speak to the issues that our leader has veritably raised. When we continue to live in denial, it portends great and destructive tendencies for our country, 150 million people. If we continue to dance and skirt around issues, we may not be able to find solutions to them in record time. The best of the United States that we're celebrating today is because people have risen up to the challenges. And I don't think our leader has denied the fact that there are challenges in our country. But what he has said is that these are the realities that we are confronted with. And in seeking to deal with those challenges, we not only need capacity, we need competence. And not only throwing resources at situations alone. If we try to address our minds to the issues that the leader has raised, I'm a member of his party, and legitimately so. In 2007, I ran for the same position, and he can attest to it why we lost that election. Today, the whole of the southwest of the of, of Federal Republic of Nigeria, to the glory of God, reflects the wishes of, Niger of the southwesterners. Mm. The way they voted, that's the result we've gotten. Okay, sir. And we were able to get that because one man stridently has stood, not because he wants to attack anybody, but because if democracy must have value, it must derive from the choices of the people. And I think as much as possible, this, this forum should recognize the challenges like he has rightly painted, and then we can begin to move in the direction of sorting them, not to begin to dance around issues. Thank you very much. Okay, I agree. And, and with that, uh, over this side, please. Uh, with the spirit of that, uh, that comment, not question, in our minds, let's please try to point some questions at the governor that will begin to get at the challenges that he has identified and, and talk about some solutions and ways forward. I'd seen, uh, I'd seen a, a hand right here early on. Yes? Mm -hmm. Nope, right there. Mm -hmm. uh, Lawrence Freeman from uh, ER Magazine, African Desk. I would like to ask the governor uh, a specific question on seemed to me you were questioning this idea of the removal of the state and the role it plays in Nigeria. And I know there's a big effort now for privatization to save the oil industry and the electrical power industry. I don't think that's going to work. I think that given the current collapse of the European and American 
financial system, the state has to issue the public credit to guide this production. I, I like some of the policies of the late Prime Minister Melo Zenaway on this regard. It seems to me Nigeria is going the wrong direction by focusing strictly on free trade and private enterprise, which is failing. And the people are going to continue to rise up unless they're given electrical power and other necessities. How is your policy for uh, Africa differ from the economic policies of the current uh, president? Okay, thank you for that question. Uh, we'll, we'll take uh, one more. Okay, the lady right here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my name is uh, Chief Dunido Ajari, Chairman, uh, Nigerian Agricultural Empowerment Program. I have to applaud the organizers of this program, and uh, I salute our Shwaju, Ahmed Bola Tinumbe. You know, I'm talking from the angle of a woman. We Nigerian women, we're not happy. We no longer smile, because you, see, you know why? It's our children. They are, they are hungry, they are unemployed, and um, uh, Asha, our Ashwa just said something which caught my attention. A hungry man is an angry man. I think the generics of this book Haram is anger and hunger. And he said, why can't we introduce food? I remember in the, whole, in the olden days, they used food to attract people to the church. Why can't we use food? For these children, because believe me, there is no leader in this world that doesn't have a mother. Even the Boko Haram too, they have mothers. A mother, we can influence anything. If we are happy, the whole world will be happy. And educate a woman, educate a nation. Make a woman happy, the whole nation will be smiling. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Chief. Okay, why don't you try to deal with these questions? Yeah, uh, thank you very much. First, let me talk about uh, a policy on privatization. We, we, we think the Nigerian progress uh, and development and development of pro progress and program can only be fired from two uh, engines. Uh, government playing uh, uh, playing its role uh, of uh, creating the necessary environment and have a selective privatization uh, of those critical areas, not only because of uh, uh, the, the problem of uh, government funding, but to, to, to eliminate corruption. We have a situation uh, since 1999 where electricity that is the most important discovery of humanity in the last 1,000 years. Without electricity, you cannot even take care of the dead. Government grapple with the electricity power sector. And because of serious bureaucracy, inertia programs and styling corruptions, they couldn't move forward. I, as a governor then, with my team, we decided to fight the monopoly of electricity with government. We introduced independent power generation. I brought the revolution to the country through the partnership of now defunct uh, energy company, Aaron. Mm -hmm. yes, yeah. yes. <laughs> and we partner. Fortunately, we brought 13 badges. Government photos. They took private sector investment. It was $83 million project, born, financed by Aaron and their partner. I was being questioned to give out 10% of the wife if the project will not fly. One of the government 
minister, a minister then asked me where is your share of 10%? And I said, uh, how do you take bribery, a uh, bribe from a man that you are begging to invest in your environment, mm -hmm. bringing his money? Don't forget, remember, there's a competition to attract investment to various countries of the world. We believe and that, that is the only way to have power constantly. Without power, you cannot promote industrial development. Without power, you cannot even create jobs. Imagine in a private sector, if you leave distribution to private sector, generation to private sector, government can continue to maintain the highways. That is our belief. Then, you are right, we have to stimulate, you know, growth. Government must spend. You cannot use austerity to kill the problem. You must stimulate growth. You must either cut and our taxes, increase taxes, derive the revenue that is necessary. Go and look at the example of Lagos State. I started from zero. Today, Lagos is assured of financial autonomy. Uh, I don't want to overemphasize the ingenuity and the creativity and the innovation of our government. But the model is there. And it's because of those performance developmental programs that we have gained six other states. As I'm speaking, we just concluded an election in one of the most critical states of the, of the country, Edo State. The government tried, the other party tried harder to snatch that state from us. But because of performance, the infrastructure development, there's no way you have uh, 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 industries without investing in, in infrastructure. You can't expect private sector to do that unless you want to give them the opportunity to recoup their, phone, their, their money from the infrastructure investment. That is okay. Mr. Uh, uh, the, the weakness in the country Today, I can reverse, reverse you and the, go back to, to, to the Mr. Ambassador. This is, go to the webpage of the Nation newspaper. Governor Aliu Babangida of Niger State. Whose party is he? Eh? <laughs> Government party. Now, and is he not from the north? Go and read this. Opening paragraph, the Northern Nigerian Governor's Forum has attributed the, the country's predicament, uh, present challenges to the rejection of core value of honesty, fairness, and justice in their community. I didn't write that. It's not in my party. Let me face the situation clearly and honestly so that we can solve the problem of the country. I agree, it belongs to all of us and it's more important than individual's aspiration. But it's only a very uh, 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 insane person uh, or population that will continue to do the same thing over and again and be punished by punishment. I can't see PDP winning an election unless uh, Nigerians are insane after, you know, uh, uh, punishing them so much for the last 10 years. I can't see it unless the elections are rigged. And we, we, we prevent it. We prevent rigging. We are ready. Well, if we do nothing else but start an inter-party party dialogue here today, I suppose we've accomplished <laughs> something. Uh, now, now uh, uh, Governor, you didn't answer the Chief's question about uh, children, food, yeah, the yeah. use of that in security uh, situation. That is why we, 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 we oh, you are right. Uh, that is why we uh, met, have met with Jonathan and gave him the blueprint that we exponentially 
regardless, exponentially improve the economy of our country, not just on the physics. Start with if you improve the nutrition of our children, you will get them to school. You will get them off the street. If you offer one egg for a child in high school or primary school, put together, you will create exponential small-scale industry in poultry. And you take the children off the street. If you offer them half a loaf of bread, you create small-scale opportunity for bakers all over the north. You, and if only because of that feeding, those children who are beggars, who are you know, uh, violent prone, will go to the class only to eat. If you offer one pint of milk for a puppy, you will stimulate dairy industry and we improve the nutrition value of our children. You will take them off the street. People will see value. Today, the government improve, <laughs> import fertilizer year after year. You don't see the yield. You don't see, it's a swarm of corruption. A salad of it. We have to stop. We have to eliminate those corruptive elements and serve the people. That's all I'm saying. Okay. okay and we've made the recommendation to the president, not from the opposition point of view alone. I, I took a paper to him and ready to help because of our country. Okay, we'll take a few more questions. I don't want anybody to despair over the uh, tenor of this conversation. Uh, trust me, we have a uh, hard enough time here in the United States getting Democrats and Republicans to talk civilly to each other. So, 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 so let's not worry too much about it, but we certainly can keep uh, uh, the tone of it down to not talking about people being insane if they vote for the other party. Okay. okay. All right. <laughs> uh, all right. Now, I saw a question right back here, and then the person right behind her. Yeah. Governor Tanubu, it's lovely to see you again. I'm Connie Freeman, and you spoke to CSIS in the mid-90s okay. when I was the director of the program there. Okay. Now I'm with Syracuse University teaching graduate seminars, mm -hmm. so it's delightful to have a chance to see you again. Um, you spoke of Boko Haram as essentially being generated the frustration of um, domestic factors and economics and of corruption. But a number of people now are beginning to speculate about the impact of the other disruptions in the Sahelian area, areas, in particular in uh, northern Mali and Niger as spreading over to Nigeria or the reverse, in other words, the connections there and whether that poses a, an increased security threat for all of the governments and all of the countries in the region, inclu including Nigeria. Could you comment on that, please? Okay, thank you. And uh, the gentleman right behind Connie there. And good afternoon, we'll Governor. To it's good to see you, and I look forward to seeing you in Chicago. <laughs> you mentioned your disagreement with Assistant Secretary of State Johnny Carson about having a minister for the North. Are there any U.S. policy towards Nigeria that is of concern to you? <laughs> oh, there's the large question. Okay, we'll have one, uh, one, one more from right this side. Yes. My name is Akin Kola Ole. I live in Nigeria. Uh, Governor Tinubu, we thank you for this brilliant lecture, as usual. My question is on security. Before the former National Security Advisor resigned his appointment, 
he made mention that Boko Haram problem was not poverty. It was political and probably governmental. And in your lecture, you alluded to community policing. And I remember you are one of those proponents of state policing. If we have to marry community policing and state policing, I think we are doing something. Because security is very, very important in any nation, any part of the world. My other question, sir. Don't you think now is a, a golden platform for the opposition to rally around and get a formidable party to get this current government that is inefficient away? Thank you very much. <laughs> Okay, Governor, we'll try those uh, two of them on security issues about Boko Haram yeah. and then the one on the U.S. policy question and the last one on uh, opposition coalition. <laughs> well, uh, thank you. I, I will address the issue of uh, uh, the Niger Sudan and, uh, uh, problem in the northern part of uh, uh, Nigeria. Yes, we had suspected that the problem of the border area and the unrest in Sudan has caused part of a recruitment opportunity for, I mean, has allowed a rep recruitment opportunity for Boko Haram, if allowed. And the, with rallied the fact that government should improve border control in those areas. If you see that Chad is ready, relatively peaceful right now and being stable, but on the other side is the Sudan. Equally, those people from Libya, because of lack of, I mean, opportunity to prolong the crisis, might be passing arms through the northern border to Nigeria. The government is seriously involved in that. I will discuss that through, you know, mm -hmm. uh, uh, those aspects with the Secretary of State and the, uh, uh, the, the UN ambassadors in, uh, in Nigeria who are, you know, uh, interested in uh, helping out the country. Today, technology is, uh, you know, offering an opportunity to track some of those cells because GSM can be tracked in, in, in the country. The other problem that is interrelated with the last question of uh, uh, U.S. policy. U.S. policy is well-intentioned. In fact, the President and the Secretary of State emphasized the need for uh, institutions, strengthening the institutions in Africa. They did the same thing in Ghana. And you could see that institutions are better strengthened in Ghana than in Nigeria today. I can equally attest to that. The U.S. will help by providing uh, uh, various assistance to Nigeria to st strengthen our security. Equally, domestic problem in Nigeria is lack of honest, honesty in the promotion of uh, various uh, programs. Lack of transparency, that's the truth. And lack of adequate provision of uh, social amenities for even the police. Ask whether they have life insurance. 
to pro protect them against danger. Whether they are adequately paid not to lease the weapon given to them to criminals in order to make you know a, a daily a quick money. So where you deny your law enforcement agencies adequate salary and good welfare program, you have indirectly promoted, I mean, pro, no, promote uh, corruption. And that is what is happening on the ground now you know, in Nigeria. The, the help necessary from U.S. to really eliminate that is to not to list Nigeria. I won't hear. Put Nigeria on the list of uh, terrorist lists is counterproductive. You can't do that. Now, because the problem today is restricted to only three regions, if critically analyzed. Uh, three states. Yobe, Bonu, and Kaduna. Kano is just infiltration from either Kaduna or Bonu. So we can't because of those three states criminalize the entire nation. It won't help the development and it won't help our democracy. There, there's no policy of uh, uh, United States that is uh, you know, much annoying other than lack of adequate attention, you know, but the other international uh, problems are there that might be ranked, you know, more serious than our self-inflicted uh, <laughs> domestic problems. Mm -hmm. uh, that's uh, the way I see it. You know, we we have enough resources to actually help us. This there's no government that is as lucky as the present administration since 1999. The oil prices is to our benefit. High oil prices, if not being stolen. Now, if government, you know, uh, come out that uh, six billion have been stolen in the last three years, theft of crude oil, totaling six billion in subsidy, another six point eight billion in direct theft of the crude on the ICs. So just put that word together <laughs> in two years. That's 12 billion US dollars. That's enough to establish four refineries. Give that to my administration. We will give four refineries to Nigeria within 38 months. They were reaching for this government. That's the problem. Self-inflicted weaknesses in the system that is uh, an epidemic almost. Okay, we have time for one more round of questions. I saw this hand right here. Uh, Derek, where are you? No, no, come, come further down. Right there, third one in. No, no, the man behind him, yep. And then we will go to the other side and then the man at the back there. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, my name is Adewale Tukumbo Shogunro. Uh, I just recently came from Nigeria, and I'm very disturbed by some of the things that I see occurring in my ancestral land. Um, in particular, I see a dis the people being disempowered. College graduates driving taxi cabs, Danfo, you know, all these things in Lagos State. Um, but I, you know, I, I won't get into that because we know. Um, I mean, we're talking about Boko Haram, all these things, but these are the implications of a failed government. People have to resort to other means to provide for their families. But uh, that aside, one thing I was curious to understand um, in, in regards to the Land Use Act in, in Nigeria, 
Um, I don't, I'm not pointing any fingers, but I wanted to comprehend what's going on. There seems to be something, uh, s current uh, things happening with the government of Lagos states that is acquiring li land forcibly from citizens, Lagosians, in Lekki and different parts of, of Lagos. Can you please expound on that or elaborate on, on what's going on? Okay. And we have a question right here. Oh, we only got one mic now, huh? Hello there. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yes, please. Hello. Hello. My name is Noel Isama. Um, my dad's the head of the ACN in the United States, so that's why I'm here. So good afternoon, Governor. It's great to see you. Um, my question is, what role does developing political identity um, play in developing democracy in Nigeria? Uh, it seems that most of these parties actually seem to lack any sort of political ideology or political identity that actually guides them. You ask the Nigerian, you can I'm asking what significant differences are there between the parties, and it's really hard to tell other than competence, I guess. So could you please elaborate on what role that plays in uh, Nigeria? Thank you. Okay. We're going to take two more questions then. Uh, the man in the green shirt at the back there who I saw early, and then at the request of the governor, the man in the front here. Oh, yeah. Ashwaju, uh, good afternoon, sir. My name is Biodon Adebonajo. I work with the department. I'm an attorney in Washington, D.C. I work with the Department of Justice as an attorney. However, I'm only asking this question in my personal capacity. Um, I think that ultimately democracy works when good policy and good governance meets people with good values and per sense of senses of personal responsibility um, and ultimately uh, I grew up in Lagos and um, during the governorship of Elijah Jaconde and my dad worked in that administration and it's just been a decline since then and the sad part is that this is just not a decline in Nigeria it's a decline around the world I think we see it in Washington also um, where people who lack character. Uh, it doesn't matter how good the intention is, how good the policy is, how good whatever it is is in place with the, the institutional um, regulations are. If the character of the people is not part, is, is not where it ought to be in order to effectuate those policies, nothing will happen. So my question is, when are we going to get to the point where we have people of competence and character to effectuate the policies that will bring about, uh, meet the aspirations of the Nigerian people? Because it's very painful to continue to watch this decline. Thank you. I'm tempted to pull, uh, have, have that question applied to America as well. Okay, one last question here. <laughs> oh, now we, I'm sorry. Which, Okay, okay, we'll do two last questions. Confusion, so we'll do two. Hi, uh, my name is Randy Eccles, and I <coughs> am a longtime friend of uh, Governor Tinubu's and a friend of Nigeria for many years. Uh, we don't want to leave Ambassador Jeter out of this lively discussion. <laughs> so I do, have one in, I do have one question <laughs> to you and two to the governor. Um, First of all, I'd like to associate myself with your remarks in introducing the governor. Uh, I was there when the first uh, government was established, uh, freely and fairly elected, 600-member uh, National Assembly, uh, 1,200 local governments uh, to be followed by a national election in 1993, the election of June 12th, which was, in my opinion, in the opinion of the uh, international community, the freest and the fairest in the history of Nigeria, of which uh, Senator Tinubu was elected. Now, uh, Ambassador, how would you describe or summarize U.S. policy towards Nigeria? Uh, my opinion, before you do, is that the oil and gas companies basically write U.S. policy towards Nigeria with Nigeria being the largest oil-producing nation in Africa 
to have to import gasoline is a travesty. And I think it has to do with the governor's remarks about uh, uh, refineries. He's already answered one of the questions I was going to ask him. But how would you uh, define uh, U.S. policy toward Nigeria? And for the governor, let me say welcome, my, my dear friend. Uh, it was a pleasure to advise and assist you uh, in exile. Uh, it was a pleasure to speak at your birthday uh, party uh, for your 55th birthday. And I've personally witnessed uh, Lagos make a turnaround in terms of infrastructure. Uh, in spite of the chaos in Nigeria, the economic chaos, there has been steady economic growth uh, in the state of Lagos. It is the engine of Nigeria. Nigeria is the engine, or at least uh, in addition to South Africa, the engine of Africa. Uh, Governor, uh, uh, who is funding Boko Haram? Um, and secondly, what, would, uh, what is the government doing uh, to, re to uh, build or refurbish the four refineries that they have that would, I think, put an end to the, the shameful importation of gasoline uh, and create energy independence for Nigeria. Okay, thank you. And, and we will take this last question here because I showed the young man I'd be taking. <coughs> uh, my name is uh, Bello Galadachi from the Voice of America, House Section. Uh, Governor, my question is uh, with the recent demolition of the, uh, the Makoko, the houses on Makoko waterfront without uh, alternatives for the residents, how is the, rule, how is the opposition party setting up an uh, example? Uh, to the masses. Okay, there's a lot of questions there, Governor. <laughs> but let's have uh, Ambassador Jeter start with a characterization of U.S. policy towards Nigeria. I'm going to give you time to think about this. <laughs> well, I think that, uh, first of all, let's begin with uh, Johnny Carson, the person who actually is, uh, I think, the central figure in our Africa policy. He's very knowledgeable about Nigeria. He's lived in Nigeria. I think he has a very sophisticated mm -hmm. understanding of Nigeria. And he follows Nigeria very, very closely. So that's a, a plus. The reinstatement of the Binational Commission, I think, was, uh, I had a little to do with that. I, I think a wonderful um, thing that was done by this administration, because it gives you a way to structure and focus on uh, so many different issues that affect the country. Now, Randy, when you talk about what is U.S. policy toward Nigeria, it's multifaceted. Certainly there's a, a big focus on the oil industry because we get 8 to 10 percent of our imported oil from Nigeria. What happens, for example, in the Niger Delta affects world oil prices. Um, so there is that aspect and uh, it's such a multifaceted uh, relationship. I don't think that you can say I can characterize it in a sentence or two. I think you have to look at the different aspects of that policy. But overall, I think that this administration has done well. They paid close attention to Nigeria. There's been a focus at very senior levels in Nigeria. I personally wish the president had done a little more. I wish he had gone to Nigeria during this administration. He didn't. Uh, God willing, if he's reelected, I think he will. So a good, solid relationship between the two countries. Okay, thank you. Uh, now the, the next questions. I was interested that we had two uh, differing views on Lagos State. One, uh, Randy, talking about the progress there and. And, and, and praising it, and another land use uh, question about uh, about some problems that may be existing in Lagos State and, and unemployed uh, or underemployed youth and et cetera. Yeah, it's, uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Randy. It's, uh, it's good to, to, to see you again after uh, many years. Uh, we are still on, in the trenches. So um, Lagos State is... Uh, 
It is it's a state like no other state. It's, it's our own New York. I'm very unique. And is the heartbeat of Nigeria's economy. It has a very tiny square miles of land, only 3,000. Slightly more than uh, Singapore. So, however, it is the microcosm of Nigerian tribes and ethnic nationalities. Mm. When Lagos is economically developing, we attract people from other areas. Perhaps some of those people you've, you've seen or met as a graduate driving down for cabs are from states affected by Boko Haram. Mr. Ambassador, Nigerian uh, Deputy Missions Ambassador, as said, one third of the population of a state residing in Lagos. I, we care for them. Hmm. That's the truth. <laughs> the, the, the problem is, when there is unemployment in various other states, when there is lack of performance in PDP control states, they migrate to state, to our state, to seek employment. We cannot uh, put all of them to work. That's the fact of life. So some of them, we have to uh, live with uh, uh, many jobs. We have four, over 48,000 civil servants. and a population of over 20 million people to cater for in Lagos State. So, and then we have a serious encroachment of federal government in the affairs of those states. Nigeria's federalism cannot be comparable to that of the level of federalism in the United States of America. We have a country that the federal government interferes with the issuing of driving license. We have a gov you have a federal system that federal government interferes with the plate license. I can't, I, this is the problem. In US, you have state police, you have park police, you have Police for every possible security environment. Nigerian states have to depend on federal government to deploy police. And once those states are in your domain state, when you start caring for them from life protective vests, against violence and others, and sleeping, housing allowance and others, you will not know when they are transferred from your state. That is bad. On Land Use Act, I will read the Constitution carefully. The land belongs to the state. Individual ownership on certain sections is straight to history and traceable. I tell you, Sinubu family, as famous as we are, and as prime as our land, sir, lost several of our lands to federal government during colonial eras. So it's, and the old violent reaction from various communities do, documenting lies. If you remember 19, if you research well, go to 1979 Constitution. It was the military administration then, because people uh, will not yield to the right 
of government or even development of roads, hospitals, and others, the abrogated individual land ownership law and vested the land in the hand of state governor. That is the law. Until that constitution is amended, the state has the authority over land matters, said the constitution, residual section of the constitution. The Makoko, I hope as an information officer, you check your latest news on the Babbage and the slums. 15 people were washed away in the last 48 hours. Any responsible government will remove those shanties. Responsible and responsive. Have you paid attention to the news from home? Is it true that the wave swept away 15 people, they are still looking for some bodies? So we can't allow Katrina to happen. We don't have the facilities. That's the reality. On the people and value, please come home and join the struggle. Please. <laughs> no, it's not. No, that's, uh, <laughs> you can join hand with the progressive. On the ideology, it's clear. We have uh, liberal democracy and the uh, conservatives uh, in, 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 in the same thing. We are tailored uh, uh, towards the uh, American political system. I, I'll be attending the DNC uh, conference to learn more and uh, see how best we can promote democracy in our country. I've been on this for, for quite a while. Um, I think I've uh, touched various areas of uh, some of the questions. Ideologically, our party is different, and we continue to pursue that. Uh, our economic uh, program is to promote independence for 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 individual are uh, offer uh, opportunity for direct foreign investment without hindrance. We believe in the two engine approach. Give the private sector the opportunity to invest and help uh, direct foreign investment in those sections that are critical to the, the economy, but government must stimulate growth by investing. Without our effort, the GSM that is in telecommunication industry that is flourishing today will not have been. Okay, we'll continue to, to, to strive harder. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Governor. Join me in welcoming your remarks.